Congratulations, true crime addicts. We've survived another week. It is Friday, February 9th, 2024. This week, crumbly crumbles. Parents pay to have their kid kidnapped. Then he turns up dead. And we might have been wrong about the Holly Bobo case. All this and more, uh, stay tuned. Yes. Super excited. We are all pumped to have James Author Renner. James Renner on. That James Renner has zeroed in. James on. Renner's once again drops a bombshell. Bomb Investigative James journalist Renner. reporter James Renner, who's been on the podcast a long time. Hi, by the local writer, James Renner. Renner. All right. Welcome back to True Crime This Week with me, your host, James Renner. Hey, um, today marks the 20th anniversary of the disappearance of Maura Murray, uh, the subject of my book, True Crime Addict, and uh, the cause of much uh, disdain. Um, but uh, Maura does remain missing. There's very few clues in the case. It's one of those cases where um, anything might have happened, anything from murder, suicide, death by the elements, running away to start a new life, it's a very bizarre case. I'm sure you've heard of it, uh, but today marks the 20th anniversary, so hopefully this is the year we finally get some answers. To that end, the Attorney General's office in New Hampshire has just released a composite sketch of what Moore might look like today if she is still alive. Here it is. Um, so if you know anything about her and anything about the case at all, please reach out to uh, authorities in New Hampshire. Send in your tip, whatever you have. There we go. Um, and as always, I want to thank Walter for manning the camera. Walter's just back from Taylor Swift's Grammys party. Yeah, I hear he had a pretty good time. Thanks, Walter. Let's get to the top stories, man. Let's jump right in. The courts have decided that parents in the United States are now at least partially responsible if their children shoot up a school. On Tuesday, a jury in Michigan convicted Jennifer Crumbly on four counts of involuntary manslaughter, according to CBS News. Jennifer Crumbly is the mother of Ethan, a 15-year-old boy who murdered four students at Oxford High School in November 2021. His parents bought him the 9mm handgun that he used in the shootings. At trial, the jury learned how Ethan's parents had many opportunities to intervene in their child's behavior prior to the mass murder. Jennifer was the last person, actually, to have the gun prior to Ethan sneaking it into school in his backpack, and it appears the boy had asked his parents for mental help, and they ignored him. After the shootings, police found a journal in Ethan's backpack in which the boy wrote things like, quote, I want help, but my parents don't listen to me, so I can't get any help. My parents won't listen to me about help or a therapist. I have zero help for my mental problems, and it's causing me to shoot up the fucking school. End quote. Now, it's possible Jennifer was distracted to some extent by her ongoing affair with a high school friend who ended up testifying himself in this uh, court case because she texted him when she was on the run from police. Now, this case is kind of a snapshot of backwards Midwest values where we're afraid of therapists but eager to teach our kids about guns. Uh, you know, back when I was growing up, my school actually gave you a couple days off if you wanted to take your gun out in the woods and go hunting. But the parents weren't the only ones who failed Ethan. The morning of the shootings, administrators at the school called his parents in for a meeting after finding disturbing messages written on one of his tests, which in hindsight appears to have been a cry for help. Ethan was sitting in that room with his backpack, which likely held both the gun and his journals, and nobody bothered to look inside. Jennifer faces up to 60 years in prison when she's sentenced this April. Deputies in Transylvania, Transylvania County North Carolina are investigating the suspicious death of a 12-year-old boy who died at a wilderness camp run by Trails Carolina, which is one of those tough love boot camps where parents sometimes send troubled kids. 
Parents can pay upwards of $30,000 to enroll their problem children into this program. And staffers from Trail Carolina, who are paid minimum wage a lot of the time, will show up at the home in the middle of the night with restraints to essentially kidnap the teen and bring them back to North Carolina. There they spend weeks in the woods, often without showers or basic hygiene items. The 12-year-old boy arrived at the camp on February 2nd and was found dead in his bed the next morning, according to the Charlotte Observer. His death has been ruled suspicious, and the sheriff's office says that Trails Carolina, they're not really being cooperative. This isn't actually the first death that occurred with Trails Carolina. In 2014, a 17-year-old boy ran away from his group and was found, in, found dead in a river 12 days later. Survivors of Trails Carolina say that the staff uses negative reinforcement and shaming as a method of breaking the kids and making them more docile. Sadly, there's many other camps like this across the country. Here's a, here's a unique suggestion. Maybe don't pawn your kids off to strangers who abduct them in the night and take them into the wilderness. Might be a start. Anyways, I'm sure we'll hear more about this case in the weeks to come. Lawyers for Zachary Adams are asking for a new trial. Now that the lead witness in the murder of Holly Bobo has confessed to lying on the stand, according to WBBJ-TV. You remember the Holly Bobo, Holly Bobo case, I'm sure. Uh, this happened back in April 2011 in Darden, Tennessee. Bobo was 20 years old. She was at home with her brother Clint that morning. And uh, Clint was awakened by the family dogs who were barking loudly. He looked outside to see a man in camouflage talking to his sister. Holly and this man were kneeling down and she seemed very upset. At first, he thought it was Holly's boyfriend. He called his mother, who explained that it couldn't be the boyfriend. He was out hunting somewhere else. And, he in, and she instructed Clint to actually shoot the man at the time. But when Clint looked outside again, he saw Holly walk into the woods with this man. She was never seen again. Her remains were found in 2014 in some woods about 20 miles away. She'd been shot in the back of the head. Now, in March of 2014, police arrested a group of young men who they believed had kidnapped, raped, and murdered Holly Bobo. Zachary Adams was convicted of the crime seven years ago, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole plus 50 years. However, there is no evidence linking Adams to the crimes. His conviction was based solely on the testimony of co-defendant of co Jason Autry. But Autry recently recanted his testimony, explaining that he worked with his lawyer to concoct a story to keep himself out of prison and to give the police the story they wanted. Personally, I've never believed in this conspiracy about the Adams brothers and their friends. In order to believe it, you have to believe that up to five people were in on this conspiracy and nobody acted to stop it. That sort of thing typically only happens in movies. By all accounts, the police at the time were under great pressure to convict somebody, anybody, and they set their sights on Zachary and the others. And if they are innocent, the real killer has been free for almost 12 years. So that's going to be a big story, I suspect, this year. Um, Tune back in. We'll, we'll follow it as it develops. Uh, I have a lot more coming up after the break, including some Marilyn Manson news, uh, some craziness up in Calgary. Uh, much more to come. I'll be back in two and two. Please hang up and try again. And we're back with Baby Boom, starring Kate Jackson. For the last week, Vermont State Police have been searching for a missing 29-year-old woman named Kayla Wright. On Tuesday, an unnamed person discovered a large container that had washed up on a sandbar near Big Falls in Missisquoi State Park. When they opened it, they discovered the body and called police. And on Thursday, authorities confirmed that that body was in fact Kayla Wright, according to WCAX. Police also announced the arrests of three individuals known to Kayla, Brianna Rooney, 
Thomas Rooney, and Jakey Tremaine Corey Keith. That's all one person. Jackie Tremaine Corey Keith. They were all arrested on drug charges, but court filings reveal uh, their suspected involvement with Kayla's death. Kayla had spent time at the Rooney's home, and when investigators pinged her cell phone after her disappearance, it led them to the house where they found her phone. Apparently, police then learned that this Keith character had contacted the Rooney's to tell them that Wright was dead and that he had disposed of her body. The story he told to police during an interrogation this week was that somebody had come to the home and confronted Kayla about counterfeit money and then shot her. So it's not clear if police at this time suspect any of these three deadbeats of actually pulling the trigger. Uh, nobody has yet been charged with her murder. Marilyn Manson has completed 20 hours of community service for blowing his nose on a videographer during a 2019 concert in New Hampshire, according to the AP. As part of his plea agreement, Mason must remain arrest-free for two years, which, you know, could be difficult for this provocateur. Several women have sued Manson in recent years, alleging sexual assault and other abuse, but those keep getting dismissed or settled out of court. Now, personally, I'm, I'm just shocked about this whole thing. Marilyn Manson always seemed like such a clean-cut guy. Just goes to show you, you never can tell from a person's appearance. The Guardian is reporting that Jess Staley, the former chief exec at Barclays Bank, stayed in close contact with Jeffrey Epstein long after he said that he had cut off ties. Now, Barclays is a big bank in the UK, and Staley is a proper rich dude. It would kind of be like if Warren Buffett got caught cozying up to Jimmy Savile. In order to keep their friendship secret, Staley allegedly used another person as a go-between to relay their messages. In one email from 2016, Epstein allegedly contacted Staley after Donald Trump's election to see if he was interested in the appointment of Trump's Treasury Secretary. The question remains what Epstein possibly had to offer such a rich man that Staley would want to remain in contact with him for all those years. I guess we'll just have to use our imagination. On Wednesday, Authorities in Pennsylvania announced that a skull found by a boy in Berks County in 2022 belonged to a missing man named Roger Hart, according to NBC Philadelphia. Hart went missing after he was charged with attempting to kill his wife in April 2004. Anyone with information about this case can just zip it. Zip it. Let's go over to weird news. 30-year-old Syed Amir Razavi, also known as Alex Lee, was charged in Canadian court this week with two counts of drug trafficking, according to the Calgary Herald. It wasn't hard for police to track down Alex Lee. He had passed out free samples of cocaine attached to his business card, which included his name and phone number, to people at a casino on Christmas Eve. And when police raided his home, they found 60 grams of coke, portioned into individual packets, $1,280 in cash, and more of those business cards. Apparently, casino management became suspicious after several people started to tell the blackjack dealers about their awesome idea for a new screenplay. Jumping over to pop culture. Last night, Max released the new true crime documentary series, uh, or just documentary, that is. They called him Mostly Harmless, is the name of it. They called him Mostly Harmless. It's the story of how online sleuths helped police identify a male hiker who died in South Florida's Big Cypress National Preserve. Another hiker found the John Doe, this John Doe, inside a tent. The man was severely emaciated, weighing only 83 pounds, as though he had like just sat there and not eaten and kind of starved to death even though there was food found inside the tent. There were no signs of trauma or drugs. Internet sleuths posted composite photos of the man's face and 
Some people who had hiked the Appalachian Trail recognized him as a friendly hiker who had identi identified himself as mostly harmless. That was the name he was going by, mostly harmless. One of these people had, one of these hikers had even taken a picture of this guy. And so they started circulating that photo on Reddit and other message boards. Now I won't spoil the ending for you, but they do eventually discover this man's identity and it's not exactly the nice guy that everybody had built him up to be. But check that out. I'm definitely gonna watch that one. There's a new true crime book coming out on Tuesday, this coming week. It's called A Murder in Hollywood, The Untold Story of Tinseltown's Most Shocking Crime. I do love a good L.A. noir story, and this is, this is right up there. Here's the write-up. From, from the outside, Hollywood starlet Lana Turner seemed to have it all. A thriving film career, a beautiful daughter, and the kind of fame and fortune that most people can only dream of. But when the famous femme fatale began dating mobster Johnny Stompanato, thug for the in infamous West Coast mob boss Mickey Cohen, her personal life became violent and unpredictable. Lana's teenage daughter Cheryl watched her beloved mother's life deteriorate as Stompanato's intense jealousy took over. Eventually, the physical and emotional abuse became too much to bear, and Lana attempted to break it off with Johnny with disastrous consequences. The details of what happened that fateful night remain foggy, but it ended in a series of frantic phone calls and Stompanato dead on Lana's bedroom floor, with Cheryl claiming to have plunged a knife into his abdomen in an attempt to protect her mother. The subsequent murder trial made for the biggest headlines of the year, its drama eclipsing every Hollywood movie. New York Times bestselling author Casey Sherman pulls back Tinseltown's Velvet Curtain to reveal the dark underbelly of celebrity, rife with toxic masculinity and casual violence against women, and tells the story of Lana Turner and her daughter, who finally stood up to the abuse that plagued their family for years. A Murder in Hollywood transports us back to the golden age of film and illuminates one of the 20th century's most notorious true crime tales. That's a, that'll be a good one. Check it out. A Murder in Hollywood. And that's the news for this week. It's the weekend. Go celebrate. Have a good time. We're all going to survive another week. I will see you next Friday. And until then, <clears throat> in the words of Murray Saul, the incomparable godfather of Cleveland Radio, we got to, 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 get down, damn it. True Crime This Week is a fearful symmetry production. Photo and artwork are licensed through Shutterstock. If you like the cut of my jib, I have another podcast you might enjoy called The Philosophy of Crime, in which I attempt to solve the big questions behind our true crime obsession by looking to philosophy for answers. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Sit, Brownie, sit. Good dog.